Hey listeners, it's your host, Aisha. So, as some of you may remember, back in December, the pop singer Taylor Swift donated $50,000 to the Seattle Symphony simply because she loved the recording of John Luther Adams' Become Ocean, which made me think, A, classy move, Taylor Swift, and B, what kind of piece of music prompts someone to donate that kind of money? So, in this episode, the composer, John Luther Adams, walks us through what led up to his writing, Become Ocean, and then he walks us through the piece. Maybe it'll prompt you to donate money to classical music, too. You know what you could do is you could subscribe to and rate and review our show on iTunes. It's a nice thing to do, and it's a lot cheaper than 50000 bucks. Anyway, enjoy the episode. My name is Daisha Clay. I'm the audio librarian here at Classical 91.7. While I'm a real librarian... I have a deep, dark secret. I know very little about classical music. I grew up listening to rock. And I know something about jazz. But when it comes to classical... But I really want to learn. So, every week on this show, a classical music expert will give me a piece of classical music they think I should know. And then we'll discuss it. Come learn with me in the Classical Classroom. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Classical Classroom. I'm Daisha Clay, and here with me today is John Luther Adams. John Luther Adams is a composer, a writer, and an environmentalist. His works are often inspired by the natural world. He's taught for Harvard, for Oberlin Conservatory, and many others. Uh, He served as composer in residence with a lot of organizations in Alaska, including Alaska Public Radio Network. His piece, Become Ocean, won the Pulitzer Prize for Music in 2014, and he was also awarded a Grammy this year for Best Contemporary Classical Composition. John, welcome to the Classical Classroom. Happy to be here, Daisha. Thanks for having me. So we're going to talk about your piece, Become Ocean, um, and we'll get to why we're talking about that piece in a while. But first, I'd love it if you could tell me about how and why nature plays such a big role in your creative work. Well, geez. Um, (laughs) I know, it's a big question. (laughs) You know, my whole life's work is grounded in what we call nature and this Mm -hmm. um, rich, complex, miraculous world that we inhabit. And really, how could it be any other way, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. everything that we are as human animals derives from the world that we inhabit, the very forms of our minds, everything that that we do, everything we think, everything we imagine that we create ultimately comes from nature. So um, I just try to to tune into that and draw directly from the natural world uh, in in my music. What what instilled the love of music in you? Where where did that come from? Well, it came from my misspent youth as a as as a rock and roller. <laughs> uh, it came from my first garage <gasps> bands. Oh, did you you played in a band? Yeah, I played in several bands, and oh, um, that's awesome. You know, I my my dad was musical. We had a lot of music in in the house when I was growing up, and I I played trumpet in the school bands, and I would sing in choirs, hey, and <laughs> I took piano lessons, but never practiced because I was more interested in playing baseball. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was sometime in the um, early mid-60s, well, it was the Beatles on Ed Sullivan show, wasn't it, that uh, (laughs) that really got me excited about music. And Uh I was probably 12 when I formed my first garage band. Nice. And, like, um, yeah. yeah. What What did you play? What did you listen to then? We, Besides um, the Beatles. Well, we we listened to the three Bs, of course, right? Yeah. Um, the Beatles, the Birds, and the Beach Boys. Right? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my early bands were cover bands. We played songs by those groups and other popular groups of the day. And you know, the the bands keep kept getting better and better mm-hmm. and. My last cover band actually opened for the Beach Boys uh, once. But, you know, I started losing interest uh, somewhere along the way. I felt constrained by by the 
the restrictions of the of the pop song form and hmm. um, got interested in this other kind of music, which has become my life's work. Yeah, and how did that happen? How, well, how, it how happened did you... through, courtesy of uh, Frank Zappa. <laughs> uh, Frank Zappa was one of my great uh, rock idols. Uh-huh. And um, on the early albums of The Mothers of Invention, there would always somewhere in the in the fine print there would be this this little quote, this defiant little quote: "The present day composer refuses to die." Edgar Varese, <laughs> and I and my little rock and roll buddies would read that and kind of scratch our heads and wonder, well, who is this Varese guy? Mm-hmm. And one day, my pal Richard Einhorn, who he is still a dear friend and a wonderful composer himself. Uh, Dick was in a in a um, a record store here in New York City, and he came across the album, mm-hmm. which was the music of Edgar Varese, Volume Two, <laughs> and he grabbed it <laughs> and brought it back and um, to the suburbs of New Jersey, and we quickly wore out the grooves on that LP. And Varez led to Cage, led to Ives, led to Morton Feldman, and this whole okay. world of of what I guess we call new music opened up, mm-hmm. and um, that has become my life's path. So thank you, Frank Zappa. Yeah, <laughs> I think we could we could all stand to thank Frank Zappa for yeah. a moment. Um, and and what about your love of of the natural world? Where did that come from? Because I read that you didn't you uh, grow up. I know you grew up a little bit in the South and then a little bit in New York City. Yeah, you know, I the, that's I think Daisha, that's the thing is that I grew up here and there and everywhere. And when mm-hmm. people would talk about going home or or or, or home, I wasn't sure what they meant because mm-hmm. there was no place to which I felt I truly belonged. I didn't yeah. know where home was. So, um, what was I? Um, Nineteen. I wound up in music school in Southern California. I was in mm-hmm. the first graduating class at the California Institute of the Arts. Uh, graduated in 1973, mm-hmm. and I'm grateful to Los Angeles for many things. Um, I think that was where I started to become really become a composer. But that's also where I became an environmentalist. I really felt lost in in the sprawl of Los Angeles, and mm-hmm. I think that made a, an environmentalist out of me, and it, it sent me in search of home. It certain, mm-hmm. sent me off looking, without even knowing really what I was doing, sent me off looking for that place uh, where I felt I really belonged. And I found that home at the tender age of 22 where? when I first set foot in Alaska, and I instantly uh. knew that I'd come home. Wow. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've I've heard of people traveling to Alaska for the first time and and just talking about how it's like you've never seen a mountain until yeah. you've been to Alaska. Yeah. You've never seen you've never seen the just how immense nature can be until you've seen Alaska. Was that your experience? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was I was I was so lucky. Um you know, I I've I lived in Alaska for most of my life, almost mm-hmm. 40 years, and I've been places and had experiences that very few people get to have in you know in this day and age. And to be a young person in Alaska in the early 70s was really a, a very a very heady experience. Uh, there was this sense of openness and unlimited possibility mm-hmm. that um, that really set the course of of my life. Yeah. Um, I, I got involved in the campaign for the Alaska Lands Act, which finally we passed in 1980, which is the single largest land preservation law in history. Uh, we were able to to um, set aside entire ecosystems in in Alaska, uh, wow. 104 million acres of of federal lands that are 
are now, at least in principle, protected in perpetuity. Wow. So that was that was very exciting to be uh, a bit player in something that momentous. But at the same time, I was just so thrilled to be in those landscapes, to be yeah. – um, in the mountains and the tundra and uh, on the faces of, of the glaciers. And I began to dream of a music that somehow resonated with all that fire and ice and space and silence. Yeah. And is that when you began to compose music that, that was inspired by the natural landscape? You know, actually, I, I, I want to say yes, uh, but... Um, I have gone back in recent years and discovered earlier pieces, pieces that I composed or or sketched before mm-hmm. my life in Alaska. And already they sort of sound like Alaska. So there's this question of, <laughs> you know, which came first? Did, did, right. did, did uh, Alaska create the music or in some way did did the music create my Alaska? Yeah, but you and it, Alaska were like puzzle pieces. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, you know, if if uh, Alaska did not exist, it would be necessary to invent Alaska, <laughs> as if that were possible. <laughs> but you know, it also started for me in right after music school, just before Alaska. I retreated to an old farmhouse in in the countryside in Georgia. And I became captivated by the music of the birds. It began with the haunting music of the wood thrush, which was, um, turns out, was my hero, Henry David Thoreau's favorite bird song. Mm -hmm. And so, really, I think, in a way, that that was the point of departure. I did a little set of, of pieces for piccolos and percussion instruments, uh, called Songbird Songs, uh, mm-hmm. as the title suggests, but they were they were my translations of the music of the birds, and in some ways that's that's really Opus One for me. So that's just before Alaska. Well. Well, there is so much that I would love to ask you about in between that and today. For the sake of time, we have to fast forward to okay. uh, to become ocean. Um, what what was it that brought this piece on? What where were you when you thought of the idea for this piece? Yeah, I was in was Alaska. It, was it close to that experience of of hearing the birds and being inspired by them? Well, you know, R- Richard Serra, the great sculptor, says that uh, there comes a point in an artist's life when all your influences have been deeply assimilated and you find yourself working from out of the work itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, the work becomes your home and um, becomes a, a, a place of its own, an ecosystem of its own. And in a way, that happened with with Become Ocean. In 2007, I wrote a piece for my friends in the Anchorage Symphony Orchestra, a piece called Dark Waves, which is ah, 12, 15 minutes long. It's for large symphony orchestra and electronic sounds. Mm -hmm. I heard the premiere of that piece and was was really pleased. Um, I'm I'm always listening for a sound that I haven't heard before, yeah. and dark waves sounded like that. So I was delighted. But several people told me after performances of dark waves in in Alaska and in Chicago and in other places, you know that was great, but the piece is too short, mm-hmm. um, which is not what you ever want to say to a composer, but <laughs> um, I felt that way too. The, the comment was, 
you know, I was just learning how to listen to the piece. I was just settling into the sound world, and then it was over. Uh So I knew pretty soon after Dark Waves that I had entered a sound world that needed more exploration. Yeah. And the result was become ocean. So it started in a way in Alaska with with that earlier piece, but I composed it entirely on the Pacific coast, a couple of thousand miles south of Alaska down in Mexico. Really? Yeah. In Mexico? Well, that's where my wife and I have been spending more and more time over the last um, decade. Yeah. In fact, I'm headed there in a couple of days. Well, and and so what I'm imagining is that you were spending hours walking along the beach, mm-hmm. staring at the ocean. Mm-hmm. Yes, developing this music. Really, I got it right. <laughs> well, yeah, that's that's certainly part of the story. We we live down there. We live right on the water. I like to say, if you have a good enough arm, you can stand on the patio and throw a baseball into the waves. It's that close. Mm-hmm. Wow. So. Part of what I did in in working on Become Ocean, and I'm not kidding here, well, at least not entirely kidding, was to sleep with the windows open. And the music of the sea would seep deep into my dreams. Mm-hmm. And then I'd get up in the morning and do my best to write down what the music that I had heard in my dreams. That is awesome. And the, so the whole piece came to me in the space of about four mm-hmm. months, which is really – unprecedented for a, for a 42-minute orchestral work. Well, now we have to hear some of the music. And, it, and it's, it's kind of it's yeah, a long piece. Yeah, we have piece. to, don't we? <laughs> it's, we, we I mean, we have, after, after that introduction, yes. As, uh, so, so it's like, I think it's around 43 minutes long. Yeah. Um, where would you like to start in the piece? I'd love it if you could just walk me through some things and tell me about what's happening. Oh, goodness. You know, it's sort of like where do you start in the ocean? It really uh, – <laughs> wherever you happen to be, yeah. uh, there's, there's a sense in which it's all alike. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's by design. I want this to be um, a, an enveloping ocean of sound that maybe is, a, is, is an invitation to a kind of oceanic state of mind, yeah. oceanic uh, consciousness. So, so you could begin at the beginning. You could begin in the middle. You could begin just about anywhere. So, I want to know about the instruments that you used Mm -hmm. in this piece. Well, it's a standard symphony orchestra. It's a large orchestra. It's um, close to 100 musicians. There are several reasons. One is that I wanted to make uh, music in which nothing stands out, in which every sound flows out of and back into every other sound. Yeah. So, yeah, you'll hear individual instruments that you recognize from time to time, but there are no solos. There are no moments when um, you know, the oboes uh, really take off and run. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's about this continuum of sound. You could think of the whole piece as one single, rich, complex, slowly evolving sonority. Mm-hmm. And really, you could think of the whole orchestra as a single instrument. Mm-hmm. Although, and it turns out that's a really hard thing to do. You know, Sibelius observed that um, the difference between the piano and the orchestra is that the orchestra has no sustain pedal. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I think in this piece, I, I set out to try and create a sustain pedal for the uh, orchestra. Yes, I noticed that. And I was thinking, like, what work that must have been for, say, the you know the the string instruments? Oh, the poor string players! You're right to you know, bow they're good that sports, way. But I, just... I I abuse them. Yeah, there are a lot of long held tones and 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 very delicate uh, tremolande uh, tremolande figures and little arpeggios that that rise and fall like the foam on the mm-hmm. waves. It really is a continuum of sound and. 
um, it's not only hard work physically, it's hard, hard work for the musicians in terms of concentration. And as if that weren't bad enough, they don't really get to hear the whole thing because they're in the middle of it and there's so much sound that you 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 know you can't really hear the totality unless you you're at some distance from it. But there are sort of movements in this piece. Well, movements in the sense that waves have movements, right? Mm-hmm. And, and is that what you use as fall. like this sort of the whole form of the piece is 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 waves. Uh, it's waves of different speeds and different um, intensities of different colors rising and falling uh, independently, and then occasionally um, rising at the same time. There are there are three big moments in the piece where all three of the choirs of the orchestra, the woodwinds, the brass, and the strings, all crest together in these. Enormous tsunamis of of orchestral sound. We should hear one of those. Do you know approximately where in the... Well, yeah, I know exactly where. I bet you do. (laughs) (laughs) Seven minutes, 21 minutes. (laughs) Yeah, let's hear one of those. divide the orchestra into three different ensembles. It's, it's really a piece for three orchestras. Mm-hmm. And I ask for the ensembles to be separated as widely as possible in the performance space. And I guess my I- ideal would be that you, as the listener, would be placed right in the middle Mm-hmm. among the three so you could feel these these tides and these waves rising and falling all around you and then picking you up and bringing you back down so you could really mm-hmm. um, get on your surfboard and, and, and <laughs> ride the waves so there, so there are three different ensembles moving at three different rates of uh, three t- different uh, tempos three wow. different rates of, of, of musical time flowing and with three different instrumental colorations and three different harmonic colorations, all mm-hmm. of which are designed to kind of uh, nest inside of one another or to blend mm-hmm. with one another in, in any combination. Well, I noticed, too, it's, you know, it's a deceptively simple piece. It's like, um, it yeah. kind of reminded me of like the, the, the musical equivalent of looking at like a Mark Rothko painting. Like, um, Thank you. Yeah, like the uh, uh, we have the Rothko Chapel here in Houston. Yes, you do. Yeah, and it's this beautiful, beautiful place, and it's and it's got these um, paintings of Rothkos that that look like they're just black, and then you sit there and you stare at them mm-hmm. with the light from the Oculus, and you n- notice the longer you sit there, all of these distinctions in the piece. You can get lost in those in those right. paintings, and I hope you can get lost and become ocean. Yeah, you know, that's something I've I've experienced in place in in landscapes in in um, in Alaska and mm-hmm. uh, in Mexico and other places, uh, it's, and it's something I aspire to in uh, my music. I, I want to create a strange, beautiful, sometimes frightening place, and then mm-hmm. invite you the listener into that place to find your own way, to have your own experience, and maybe to hear something that I didn't know Mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. Um, And so oftentimes the surface of my music and even the form of an entire piece is very simple and appears not to change. There's no... um, There are no jump cuts. There's no... There are no dramatic events. But that's because I've come to feel that the longer we stay in one place, the more we notice change. Mm-hmm. 
Right. So if you're willing to sit on that bench in the Rothko Chapel and let your eyes adjust and and enter into um, the world of that light, both the outer light in the room and the inner light that emanates from those paintings, Mm -hmm. then you're going to have an experience that um, is uniquely yours. And Mm -hmm. I hope for something similar for a listener who's willing to take her time, settle down, and just listen deeply. Well, and that's a good segue, actually. I'm going to shift gears a little bit here in the last few minutes that I have with you and talk about what um, prompted me to, to contact you to be on this episode was that, that uh, Taylor Swift, the pop musician, just donated $50,000 to the Seattle Symphony because she loved their performance of Become Ocean. And I was just wondering, um, first, just what your opinion of that was. Like, what, what were your thoughts when you heard that news? Well, I was, I was delighted. Mm-hmm. What a generous and, and, and classy and open-minded um, thing that is. Yeah. yeah. Do you, you know, I, I, I think about Frank Zappa introducing me and my generation to Varese and mm-hmm. this whole new world of music, and maybe Taylor Swift is doing something similar yeah. for her fans. I was going to say, we've kind of come full circle in this discussion. We've yeah. come started at pop music and are ending at it. Do, do you yeah. think that, that, that this will maybe bring some new audiences to the classical music world? Well, I have no idea, and, you know, in a way it's not my job, but, right. um, yeah, yeah I, 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 think, I think so. I certainly hope so. I'm encouraged by my experience of young listeners today. I mean, I, I think 20-somethings, 30-somethings, uh, maybe even younger people mm-hmm. are very sophisticated in their listening habits now. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're listening to a remarkably wide range of music, and really, they don't seem to care where mm-hmm. it comes from or what it's called. If it grabs them by the ears, they're listening, and I, I just think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah, that's you know, that's something that I've learned from from doing this show is that those those distinctions. I mean, you know, if you listened to "Become Ocean" and you listened to maybe one of Taylor Swift's songs next to each other, they might you sound might think, pretty yeah, different. What, what's this got to do with with right. anything? But but but, that, but those distinctions really, on closer inspection, are they're sort of arbitrary and maybe even unnecessary. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I I have often wondered what it is that people respond to in my music. I mean, what mm-hmm. I would love to talk with Taylor Swift about you know, what she heard in Become Ocean that touched her. Right. Yeah, uh, I was, prompted, I'm really curious about that what too. What prompted her, you know, uh, what spoke to her condition and prompted her to, to make this generous gift to the, to the orchestra that commissioned and, and premiered and recorded the piece. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I'm, I'm, encouraged that, I'm encouraged that more and more young people seem to be discovering not only my music, but this kind of music, you know, that, that uh, we're talking about, this whatever you want to call it, contemporary classical music, new music, um, I don't know what to call it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> but I think part of what, what listeners tell me they're responding to is uh, the, the sensuous nature of the sound itself. And for me, music is, uh, uh, music is about a lot of things, but uh, one of the primary things that music is about is sound. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's something that comes from my own past as, as a rock musician. I mean, I was really in touch with that primal, that visceral, that physical energy of the best rock music. Right. And um, I, I think I still aspire to something similar in my own music, and I respond to to something similar in 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 all music. I mean, I respond to the the sensuality of Debussy or Sibelius. Yeah, it's just about sound, the beautiful, miraculous power of sound to touch us and move us. Well, that is a great place to end the discussion. John Luther Adams, thank you so much for being on the Classical Classroom. This has been fascinating. I wish I had you for another two hours. Mm, but, uh, thanks. <laughs> no, it's been, a, been, been great fun for me. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Appreciate it.
All right, everybody, that does it for this episode of Classical Classroom. For more Classroom, go to houstonpublicmedia.org slash classroom. Follow us on Twitter, Tumblr, YouTube, SoundCloud. Rate us and review us on iTunes. You can also send me an email at dclay at houstonpublicmedia.org. I love getting your emails. Thanks today to audio producer Todd Swifty Holslander for twiddling knobs. Thanks to program director Sinjin Flynn for just being a blessing. Thanks to editor Mark DeClaudio for his piercing blank space eyes. Thanks to John Luther Adams for being here today from uh, Radio Arts, a cat-friendly recording studio. <laughs> thanks to me for saying words. But most of all, thanks to you for listening. We'll catch you next time.